All right, so last class, we mentioned global variables versus local variables. Global variables are just the ones that are defined above any function or outside of any function. Local variables are the ones that are defined in the functions. The reason you might make a variable global is because it's accessible inside every local, every function in that file. If you're not going to use global variables, which I tend to recommend you don't, instead you're going to have to pass that data in to the function. So if we need to call the test function from somewhere, and we need to play with that value for some reason, we would create a parameter called i. And when we called test, we would pass a value in for i, which we probably do somewhere down if we find a main. Well, I'm not spotting it, but like that. Calling test, and we pass in either a number or we pass in a variable. And when we call test, this argument, as it's so called, 100, we get passed in to fill this parameter variable. And then it could print it out and do all sorts of math, whatever. But even though it adds one to it here, it doesn't modify the value that, right? Because what could you do to it? Is that 100 going to suddenly become 101? And every time you try to print out 100, it's going to print out 101? It doesn't even make sense to try to comprehend changing that constant by adding a 1 to it. Now, people will think that if you, try, if you pass in a variable like that, as an argument and then the function accepts a parameter variable and it fills it in that if that function changes it like it does here when we try to change i it will change a as well but it doesn't because it just gets a copy of it it's like I hand you a photocopy of a dollar you can do anything with that photocopy that you want I still have the dollar So a do-while loop, a do-while is a post-test loop as opposed to a pre-test loop. We've had four loops, and we've had used while loops. So a do-while loop looks like this. Wrong app. So, you know, we could set x equal to 0, and we can do while x is less than 10. Almost going into uh, Python there. Right? We could print out x and add 1 to it, something like that. See out x. We can add 1 to it, right, x plus plus. And eventually, x is no longer going to be less than 10. Now, what if x was not equal to 0? What if it was 5? Well, if it cruises in here, 5 is less than 10. So it would go into loop and print out 5. It add 1 to x. x is now 6. Still less than 10, prints out 6, add 1 to it, 7 is still less than 10, adds 1 to it, 8 is still less than 10, adds 1 to it, 9 is still less than 10, adds 1 to it, 10. 10 is no longer less than 10, so it would stop. So what this would have printed was 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. All right, I'm just going to do a little bit of judicious cut and pasting. What if this was already equal to 10? Nothing's going to happen, exactly. Nothing prints. But do loops are post-test loops, meaning that the loop happens at the end. This is a pre-test loop, so the test happened at the beginning, and that's why it wasn't able to get in there. So if we had the same code, but it was written like this, do this stuff while x is less than 10. Then it would work the same way, effectively. It'd print out a 5. It'd add 1 to it. Is 6 less than 10? It sure is. It'd print out a 6. It'd add 1 to it. Now 6. Now it's equal to 8. It'd print out 8. Add 1 to it. So it's 9. 9 is less than 10. It'd loop back up here. It'd print out 9. Add 1 to x, which is now 10. 10 is no longer less than 10, so then it would bail at that point. Same output, so we could do it either way. Doesn't matter which way we chose to do it, but if we took this code and we changed that x to a 10, just like we did before, then it's going to print out 10, right? Because do this stuff, all right, 
do print out x. Yo, I printed it out. Add 1 to x. x is now 11. Is 11 less than 10? No. So then it falls out of the loop. But it did print something. It went into it. So use a do loop or do while loop, which is a post test loop if the loop body must execute at least once. Otherwise, with a while loop, depending on how you write the logic, it might not go into it at all. Just like when x was, was equal to 10, it did not go into the while loop at all. But when x is equal to 10, it did go into the do loop. So I don't remember if this is a quiz question or not, but if you had something like this, x is equal to 3 and then while I shouldn't belabor this while x is less than 10 add 1 to x right and then print out x here what's it going to print out it's going to print out 10 because x is 3 well that's less than 10 Add 1 to it, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and it's only when x becomes 10 that it, this condition is no longer true, so it's going to fall through and finally print out the value of x. And we can put the curly braces in there if that makes it easier to read. What if x was equal to 30? I'm going to just copy and paste that. You know, you're not going to be able to follow along, most likely, unless you're insanely fast typers. So x is equal to 30. While x is less than 10, is x less than 10? No. No, so it's going to print out 30 here. It did not add 1 to it. Excuse me, why did I type 10? It prints out 30. What if this is a do loop? A do loop would give us the same answer if we started at 3. x is equal to 3, do some stuff, do all that stuff while x is less than or equal to 10. And then when we print it out, since it stops when x is equal to 10, that's what x would be when we print it out. However, if we took the same code and we started it at 30, please ignore the fact that I'm forgetting my semicolons, then it would zip in here. It would add 1 to it. So x is now 31. But that's no longer true, so it would fall out and it would print 31. So your rules of thumb tend to be use a do loop if the body must be executed at least one time. Performed, how about that? That's a less sinister word than executed. Use a for loop if the body will process a sequence of values like a counter or items in an array. So like one, two, three, four, five, or something like that, or you have five items stored in an array, you'd use a for loop. Otherwise, use a while loop. Or an indeterminate loop. Determinate loops are ones where you know how many times it's going to execute it. I used to pass tense there. Oh, do I have the recorder going? Yeah. All right. So if you know you're going to iterate through the numbers 1 through 100, you could use a for loop. That's a determined, definite loop. Why did I call it indeterminate? Indefinite loop. All right. So I'm going to put in parentheses definite loop here. Now you can write a while loop that does a definite loop, right? You could make the while loop count from 1 to 10, and that's just what we were demonstrating. But their for loops are better suited for that, and so while loops are better suited for something like while not in the file, or while user wants to repeat the game, that kind of thing. An indefinite loop where you don't know how many times the user is going to want to repeat the game, or you don't know how long the file is going to be when you read it. So a do loop is probably also going to be an indefinite loop, but you could program it as a definite loop as well. And since it has that special feature of always executing at least once, I'm not going to even say whether you should use it for a definite or indefinite. 
except that my preference, most people's preference, is to try to always in encode their definite loops as a for loop. Bless you. So a do loop performs the statements first, then it tests the expression. And you folk who took uh, fundamentals didn't have do loops in Python if you learned Python. So this is a slightly new thing. On the other hand, you did have for loops and while loops. So the anatomy of a do loop. You do have to put the semicolon here after the while. Whereas any other time, if you put a semicolon after an if statement or a while statement, it breaks the code. In this particular case, we have to because it ends the syntax of the whole thing. And the compiler needs to know when to end it. Otherwise, like if we had, you know, another line under here, like C out X, right, like that. It doesn't know where the end of this line is as opposed to the beginning of this line. So we would have to put the semicolon there. And I sure hope I did that in all my notes. Why don't we go back and look? I got one there. I got one there. Whoa, look at me. I got it right. I'm proud of myself. However, I sure did leave off another, a lot of other semicolons. So a do loop always executes at least once. A body always executes at least once. Execution continues as long as that while expression is true. This says it's useful in menu-driven programs to bring the user back to a menu to make another choice. Honestly, there's nothing you can write with a do loop that you can't write with a while loop with a little bit of jiggering, which is why Python is able to do away with it entirely. But if they say that a do loop is useful for menu-driven programs, I'll buy that. And then the for loop. For loops are awesome. For loops. Takes all the other loops and in the darkness binds them, like for the Lord of the Rings fans. Initialization for x equals 0. Test, x is less than 10. Update, x plus plus. And either a single statement or a block of statements inside angle braces. And in this case, you don't put the semicolon there because it would break it. It would just run through it and not even do anything. And then later on, it would perform this statement exactly once. And we could prove that to ourselves. Maybe we ought to pop open Visual Studio for those of y'all who have fallen asleep. Guess we're on S. Picture S. Grab my boilerplate. View Solution Explorer. Right click, add source files, add new item. S.cpp. So if you put it in the wrong place, I hit break and type it in. S.cpp. All right, paste my boilerplate. Now I'm good to go. So I'm going to write a for loop the correct way, and then I'm going to mess it up with a semicolon in the wrong place. So why don't we just declare a variable called x so that we can play with it? And then for parentheses x equals 0 x is less than or equal to 10, x plus plus, end parentheses on the next line in angle brace, c out, arrow, arrow, x, arrow, arrow, e and dl.
and then let's see out just some kind of message. See out error, error quote. Okay. Next, dot, 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 backslash in. Because we're going to do this again, but we're going to copy that for statement and put a semicolon at the end of that first line after the X plus plus close parentheses. So I'm just going to take all that, right click, copy, come down here. But I'm going to put a semicolon there. Oops. Now I need to change this. That's int x is actually a syntax error. I need to replace it with x equals 0. No, I don't need to replace it with x equals 0. I can just delete that line entirely because we're going to initialize it again with that x right there for x is equal to 0. So do make sure that you delete that line that I copied, int x, from where it reappeared, where I pasted it there. That was incorrect. All right, so the only difference between these two chunks of code is that I have a semicolon there. All right, and so what did it do? The first one performed correctly. It counted from 0 to 10, which is what I wanted, right? Because my fourth syntax, start at 0, keep one running while x is less than or equal to 10. The second time, with the semicolon here, it short-circuited it. It just kept executing this line over and over and over. It is as if, go ahead and watch for a second, but don't make this change because I'm going to undo it. It is as if the code was like that. Do this stuff over and over and over. Well, there's nothing to do. And then, oh, by the way, now that we're all done with that, go ahead and print out x. Well, x equal to 11 once the loop was done. So that's a long way of going to say never put a semicolon after the for statement, just like you never put one after an if statement, and just like you never put one after a while unless it's at the end of a do while construct. Now, normally, you create the variable right there inside the for loop. So if I had done that, if I had made that change, if I put int x there and then I'd put int x there, I'm going to undo this change really quickly, so don't be following along and doing them with me. Then I'd get a syntax there. It would say x is undefined. And you'd go crazy looking at it. X is not undefined. I see it defined right there. Well, the reason it's undefined is because of that semicolon. Because, just like I said, putting a semicolon there is the same thing as doing that, right? And so X is only defined between that body of the, those braces, between those braces. And then you come down here, and, well, that's outside of those braces. So, all right, now I'm going to undo all those changes. I want our example of how bad it is to be as pristine as it was before. There. All right. But that's the anatomy of a for loop right there. You initialize it, you set your condition there, and you set your update there. Now, if you want, you can leave off parts of this. And what do I mean by that? If I went down here and wrote a for loop that looked like this, for, and then I just started off with a semicolon, and I said x is less than or equal to 20 semicolon x plus plus and I did something with that right print out x again see out x see out error error x error error India it would skip the initialization step but it's not a syntax error right it's just not going to change the value of x so since x was 11 here and this one printed out 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and 10 correctly. Well, since x is equal to 11 at this point, when it gets into the body of it, x is still equal to 11. And it's going to print 11 there, and then it's going to print 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and so on, all the way up to and including 20. So it prints 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. 
I guess I should test that before I brag about it too much. All right, and so we see, and increase the font size. So it printed out 1 to 10 as expected, then it printed out OK next, and then it printed out the 11. And then that next loop started it off at 11 and ran to 20. So the initialization step was skipped because we didn't put anything there. And the loop still worked. Now you, you could keep the you could forget the last part off too. Now you have a perhaps the likelihood of obtaining an infinite loop if you do that. But I could do this for parentheses, semicolon, x less than or equal to 30. We're going to go a little bit farther, semicolon, and then don't do the update. And so then we could see out x, error, error, e, and dl, and then we'd better change the uh, value of x inside here if we're not changing it up there. Now, by the time you start leaving things off of it, you may as well just have used a while loop, right? This is the exact same thing as say while x is less than or equal to 30, right? We're no lo we no longer have a good syntax. If you're skipping the initialization step and you're skipping the update step, then it may as, just be, may as well just be a while loop. But you'll see expert C programmers go ahead and do all sorts of weird permutations of the for loop syntax. There's nothing you can do with a for loop that you can't do with a while loop and vice versa. I believe that to be a true statement. You can you know, leave things off of the for loop, and the more things you leave off of it, the closer it behaves to a while loop. So why do they let you leave those things off? Well, because you might not want to change the value of x. You might not want to reset x to something as you're going into it. You really don't have to type in everything that I type in. The important thing is to be listening and watching, and I have y'all type it in to burn it in, but it's not, I don't count you off if you don't have it all typed in. I guess it's kind of... So the for loop mechanics, you have your initialization, like x is equal to zero, your test and your update. And then your code block goes here. And so the order in which these things are, occur is the initialization happens, we set x equal to zero, and then the test, while x is less than or equal to 10, and then it goes to the body, and then it comes back up and it does the update. And that's kind of weird. You might think that it's going to do the update first because it's in front of that, but instead it's the last thing that happens in the loop. So just like when we have this code right here, and we left off the update, where we put it was right here because it's the last thing that happens after the body of the code. So, printing out hello five times. Initialize count to one. Keep repeating as long as count is less than or equal to five. So, it'll print out hello when count is one. Do it again for two, for three, for four, and for five. And then once count is no longer less than or equal to five, it'll fall out of the for loop. And notice it's okay to leave the braces off, but if it's two lines of code, you can't leave the braces off. Like if we had something else here, I don't know what, but you know, count, see out, goodbye. Something like that. Well, what it's really going to print is hello, 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 and then it's going to print goodbye because this is not really part of the loop. Even though it looks like the loop, this isn't Python that, where everything is dictated by uh, by invention. So it's like that was a, it's not letting me format it correctly. It's like this was typed over like that in Python. That's why it's a good idea to go ahead and put braces everywhere. And so the for syntax, sign one to the counter, test it, is counter less than or equal to five? If so, you're making me sleepy. Out output the counter, or output hello, and then add one to the counter. I did that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So let's write a loop that does this. We're going to print out the numbers, and then print out a tab, and then print out the number squared. 
and then I'll try to go more slowly. I apologize here. Okay, so here I am at the bottom of my code, above my pause statement, and I'm going to write something that counts from 1 to 10, and it's going to print out the 1 to 10, but it's also going to print out the number squared. So for parentheses, and I feel like changing it up so that we're no longer using x anymore, why don't we use y? Four parentheses int y equals 0. y less than or equal to 10, semicolon, y plus plus. Wait, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Look over here doing int y equals 0, and on the other one you never actually, like, I, oh, wait. The reason I did that is because you don't have to redeclare your variable. And if I had been redeclaring my variable, I wouldn't have been able to do that special effects where you kept updating it. If you put this here, then y exists only between these things. And I wanted that x to exist from all that code all the way down to the end so that we could count from 1 to 10 and then 20 to 30 and then you know, 40 and stuff like that. This is how you'll normally do it. You'll almost always put the data type there rather than leave it off. And I shouldn't have spent so much time leaving it off. I was trying to demonstrate how, you know, if you went into the while loop or the for loop, it'd keep counting. So then C out X, excuse me, C out Y, C out arrow, arrow Y, arrow, arrow, quote, in, no, wait, quote, backslash T, end quote. Error, arrow, y times y, error, arrow, e and dl. Wait, what is that? Slash? And that's going to be a probably, perhaps a syntax error. I'm not sure if it's going to be a syntax error or not. Yes, ma'am? What does it slash t mean? It means tab. It's like hitting the tab key on your keyboard. Oh. Just like slash n means new line, slash t means tab. Okay. In fact, that's worth calling out as a comment. Slash t, backslash t means tab, backslash n means new line. And that's really not, there's a couple others, but that's really not. All right, and it printed out a little table of squares. 0 up through 10 and 0 up through 10 squared. Are we all good? I need to slow down. It's okay to tell me to slow down, gang. You don't have to wait until I check 30 minutes later and find out that you're 20 pages behind because I was an idiot. All right, so when to use the for loop? Any time that it requires an initialization, a condition to stop, and an update, you can write it as a for loop. If you don't need to initialize, you can move that thing off, you know, the first one, that int y equals 0 or whatever. If you don't need an update, you can leave that last thing off. If you don't need a condition, now, now you're getting into you know, a real permutation of it that is, is pretty bizarre. In that case, you just use a while loop or something. But if you have, and this, see, pretty much every time you have a counting loop, you're going to have all three of those things. Initialize your counter, tell it when to stop, and how to update it. If you want to count from 10 to 100, we just initialize it to 10, make our condition less than or equal to 100, and add 10 to it each time, or something like that. So let's say that we wanted to print out all the numbers between 3 and 30, but skipping by 3 each time. Ooh, oh my. So parentheses int t equals 3, t less than or equal to 30, semicolon t plus equals 3. Add 3 to it each time. Now I'm going to mess with this a little bit. C out arrow arrow t arrow arrow quote space quote but not putting an e and dl. I want all of my output this time to appear on one line. 
so to say 3, 6, 9, 12, and so on. And then I'm going to write out the end of the line after the closing brace. So what we should see is 3, 6, 9, 12, all the way up to 30 in one line separated by spaces. And there we do. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, 30. So what would be the difference between putting TL and DL before the brace? What happens if we put E and DL here? No, no, no. no. Is that what you mean? No, after that. After this one? Well, try it on yours. See what happens. And I'll show you. Oh, you can copy the whole thing and move it up there, right? I see what you're doing. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you're going to have to delete that word. So yeah, yeah, now you're good to go. See what it did differently? It didn't print it in a horizontal line because it, after every number printed, it hit the, the inner key and then put the E and the L in the back. So. Oh, okay. So, yeah, the difference is is that if I leave this E and DL inside the braces, you get a syntax error because I left this line down here. But if that was new there, Right, it printed out 369. It printed it vertically rather than horizontal because after every number, it also printed out the line feed, the new line, the slash in. So I'm going to take that out. So the for loop, like the while loop, is a pretest loop, meaning that the test happens first. This loop wouldn't even execute at all because count has been initialized to 11. And then is count less than or equal to 10? No, it's not. It was set to 11, so it's not going to print hello at all. Or if we're going to get all fancy about it, the following loop will never iterate. You can put multiple expressions inside the initialization step if you want. For x equals 1, y is equal 1. Kind of weird, but you can. Can if you put multiple? If you're not using that, those bases, then why would you have initialize y? Now, you could have just as easily as initialized y there. And I don't see the point of what they're doing here because they don't update <coughs> y in here. So to me, this looks dumb. I would have just written it like this. Int y is equal to 1. Taking that out. And now we have a little orange box that's in the way, right? But anyways, right. I don't see an advantage to initializing Y right here. But you could have times when you want to have both variables initialized inside the loop. Mm. And we could write one. Wait, no, look at the next slide. That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing here? Okay, yeah. So you update both of them, right? We update both X and we update Y. Let's play with that idea just a little, except we're not going to copy them exactly. I need to test something out. Can we create two variables? Can I do this? In, in, don't type what I'm doing. Int s equals 4. Or is that going to be a syntax error? Is that exactly what they had? Well, now I'm getting an error. Instead, they had t equals 3, s is equal to 4. They did not declare both of them. All right. Well, I can live with that. Let's create two variables first. Int a comma b. And then let's do four parentheses, A equals 1, comma, B equals 10, semicolon. So that's our initialization step. And we're going to keep running while X is less than 10, 
So x less than or equal to 10, that's our test, that's our condition, semicolon. And then every time it iterates, I want to add one to a, but I want to subtract one from b, just for funsies. Going, that doesn't sound so fun to me. But anyways, a plus plus comma b minus minus. I had a semicolon at that spot, and that was incorrect. I'll tell you what, instead of doing minus minus, let's do b plus equals 10. Let's add 10 to it each time. So I just changed it to that. And now I'm going to print out a followed by a tab followed by b. So c out, arrow, arrow, a. Arrow, arrow, quote, backslash t end quote, arrow, arrow, b, arrow, arrow, e, and dl. And so it's going to print 1, 10, 2, 20, 3, 30, 4, 40, and so on, because each time it iterates, 1 increases by 1 because of a plus plus, but b increases by 10 because of b plus equals 10. Wait. You didn't execute one. You didn't execute. Did I put a semicolon after or something that I should have done? I'm not spotting it yet. Somebody tell me. Oh, it's X. X, right, 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 right. That needs to be A less than or equal to 10. Thank you for catching that. I would have stared at it for, for 20 minutes. I had to fix that. I had to make it A less than or equal to 10, not X less than or equal to 10. I'll bring it right back up. After I verify it works. Okay, 110 all the way up to 10, 100. And you would think that you shouldn't get into that state, and I would agree. So like I said, you can omit the initialization step. And here, since they've already set sum equal to 0 and num equal to 1, they skipped it. Now I'd say why. I'd go ahead and initialize it. I don't see an improvement. But this is just an example, just showing you that the syntax works. It's not a syntax error. You can declare variables in there. And this is kind of the preferred thing. Unless you need to declare more than one variable in your initialization step, that's the cleanest syntax, and it guarantees that num is only active inside the for loop. If I went here to my code and I tried to print out t after that, if I made the c out t right here, it would tell me that variable doesn't exist. And that's a feature. It's not a bug. We want this variable to exist only between these braces. If for some reason you want to check the value of t later, then you don't declare it like that. Instead, you declare it outside like we did here. We could go down here, and now we could print out a and b at this point, and it would print 11 and 110 or whatever. But if you want that variable to only be alive there, or so-called in scope there, or local to that block, to that body of code, then you declare it inside like we did there. I could prove it to myself and then undo it, right? If I do C out, error, error, T, error, error, E, and DL, it's going to flag that as an error. T does not exist. T is undefined. And that's a good thing because it means that we aren't accidentally using a variable that we may have used before. Like what if I thought I needed a X variable here? And so I wrote a 4, you know, and, and I said, okay, x is equal to 10, and I did 4, you know, don't, don't type this because I'm immediately going to delete it. But it turned out that I had x defined up here, and I, that it was a really important value for the rest of the code, and then I'm erasing it, and I'm replacing it with something else. Well, for one thing, we shouldn't be using single letter variable names, but we are just because they're easy to type. But if we had declared it as for int x equals 0 in here, then it would not touch the original value of x. 
you know, we could prove that to ourselves, but just trust me on it. If I do that and I change X somehow and then I come down here and I print out X, it's going to equal 30 or 31 or whatever X was after all that other code. And it's not going to have been changed by that because it's being redeclared there. Keeping a running total. To do a running total, you do this just like you did in fundamentals. If you did it in fundamentals, you declare your accumulator, which is a variable that's going to hold the sum, and you initialize it to zero. Then you have a counter, right? And you can add things to the sum. Here we're adding up the sum of all the numbers, which is called the summation. But instead, you might be adding, you know, test scores that they enter, or you're trying to calculate the average temperature. So you're going to be putting in all the temperatures. Let me see where we're going with this. What is going to be our homework assignment based on this concept? Oh, I'm not seeing one. All right. So be it. So the logic for keeping a running total, you put your sum variable, your accumulator variable, your total variable, you initialize it to zero. And then we have a loop. Is there a number to read? Read the number. And then add the number to our total, total plus equals number or whatever, and then come back and is there another number to read? This is, would be if we're opening a file and we're reading from it which is not the example they gave here. Instead, they did while numbers less than or equal to 10, add that number to our total. So here's an example that's asking for sales figures for a certain number of days. How many days do you have sales figures for? CIM, arrow, arrow, days. So maybe they typed in 10. And then get the sales for each day. Starting counter at 1, counter is equal to 1, counter is less than or equal to days, count plus plus. So, end of the sales for day number count, which starts at 1. And they type in a number, and we add that to the total. And then it adds 1 to the counter, and it comes back around. Enter the sales for day 2. They type it in, it gets added to the total, and that keeps happening. We add 1 to the counter, it keeps going on until they, we have exceeded the number of days that they requested there. And so then we could do whatever we wanted to with the total. We could calculate the average or you know, whatever we were supposed to do. Sentinels. I believe we've talked about sentinels. A sentinel value is a special value that can end the data. Enter test score or negative 999 to quit. That kind of thing. Well, let's do that. Are you back up and running? Okay, so how'd you do it? Or did you create a new project? Or restart it? Okay. So let's do that. Let's tell the user that they're going to be entering some test scores and can use negative 999 to stop. See out, arrow, arrow. Enter test scores. You can use minus 999. Now I'm breaking it up into two lines, but you don't have to. See out error, error, quote, to stop. Backslash in. And you see why I did that. I was just running out of space. So let's get the first test score. Well, we need a variable to hold our test scores, right? Maybe make it a double. Double score is equal to zero, and we're going to need a total, an accumulator. Double total is equal to zero. And now we can ask for the first score. So C out, arrow, arrow. I'm going to push this up. C out, arrow, arrow, quote. Enter test score. 
or minus 999 in parentheses space and I like using an angle nowadays I've kind of decided I like doing that to tell the user where to type so I just put an angle before my end quote end quote in parentheses wait no parentheses this isn't a print statement we're not doing Python semicolon and now let's let him type it in CIN greater than greater than score and now we're gonna have a while loop. the while's just gonna say while score not equal negative 999 while score not equal to negative 999 in parentheses curly brace total plus equals score add the score to our total and then now we better ask for it again so we're going to wind up repeating these two values we could even use a cut and paste I could take those two statements and copy them and paste them inside the braces. I think that's one reason why I get ahead of people is I do some copying and pasting and other people type in without doing the copy and pasting. And now that the loop is done, we could print out the total. See out arrow, arrow, quote, total equals space end quote error error total error error india and it'd be fun to calculate the average as well but we don't know how many items there were to figure out how many items there were we would need another counter that we added one to each time I guess before I brag about it and wander around, I should make sure it, it actually works. So I'm going to run it. Enter test score, alright, 800. Enter another test score, 20, 30, minus 999. And so our total was equal to 150. So if we wanted to modify this to keep track of how many items we'd entered, what would we do? We declare a variable here, and then inside the loop we'd add one to it each time. Um, so we declare something called count, or num scores, or something like that. Set it equal to zero, and then inside our loop we'd add one to it. And then to calculate the average, it would be the total divided by the count. And there's a problem with that. What if they enter negative 999 as their first piece of data? Then count is equal to zero. And when you try to calculate the average as total divided by count, you divide by zero, it doesn't work. So then we'd have to have an if statement down there in order to handle that special case where they don't enter any data at all. Because what's the average of nothing? And not even that. <laughs> But we, that, that would be the best thing to do, is to initialize a variable called average and set it equal to zero and print that out if they didn't enter any data. So the negative 999 was our so-called sentinel value. meaning that it is the special value of non-valid data that ends the data entry. Now why do I say non-valid? Because you can't really make a test score of negative 999 unless your, your teacher is absolutely insane. 
So we're using it as a signal value. Are there other ways to do this? Yeah, we could let them type in a test score or Q to exit, right? That'd be better. I'd rather type a Q to exit than negative 999. Unfortunately, we don't really know how at this point to convert from a string to a number. We could learn, but right now we use arrow arrow to read into a variable and that variable is going to be an int or a float or a double or a string, but it can't be both, right? It can't be both a string and a number. So that's why we made this of the same type as the rest of our data, but it's not a valid value. Usually I show negative one, right? Because you can't earn a negative one and it's easy to type, right? So using negative one as our signal value. And so it's a special value that cannot be confused with valid data. And it's used to terminate input. It ends the loop. Now this particular structure is what in fundamentals was called a priming input. Right? We had to get a piece of data before we could write a while on it. And then we had to repeat the data entry here. So we wound up with the input statement being in two different places. And that's why we copied and pasted it. I'm not particularly fond of that mechanism, but the alternate, the alternative is uh, not shown in the textbooks. I bet we could write it. I bet we could write it with a do loop in such a way that doesn't use the break statement. Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say C out error, error, quote, enter one number per line or negative 999 to quit. So do curly brace. Let's get the score. So CN error error score. And then as long as the score is not equal to our century, so if score not equal to negative 999, then we add that to our total. Total plus equals score. semicolon, then a closing brace, go down to the next closing brace, and since it's a do statement, we put the while clause in the bottom. So lined up with that do, we're going to put our while clause, while, parentheses, score not equal to negative 999, in parentheses, semicolon. This does the same thing logically as the other one does. It's, the difference is, is that it does not have a priming read. It's just I have some kind of psychological complaint about copying and pasting code, having the same code in more than one place. And this eliminates it, right? Because we only have one place where we're entering the score. The price we're paying for that is we have some extra logic. We have an if statement to rule out the century. To do this, we had better reinitialize total to zero unless we're just going to keep tacking on to the scores that we had already. So above my do line, I would probably like to set total equal to zero. So I'd probably go above my do line and do total equals zero semicolon there. And at the bottom, I might want to print it out again. So after my while statement, see out arrow, arrow, quote, total, colon, space, end quote, error, error, total, error, error, ENDL, like that. If it makes sense to you that this is the same logic as using the priming read, 
And if you'd like the looks of this one better, go for it. The book doesn't illustrate this, so maybe you don't want to do it that way. Maybe you want to do it the other way, the first way, because we've done this in two different ways now. One way did not require a if statement inside the loop. This way does. I'd be preferential towards this one because the input statement only occurs in one place in the body. It doesn't happen before the loop and then in the body. And I'm going to run it to make sure it works. Just in the last class, I made a whole bunch of changes. I saved it. It compiled correctly, and so I wandered around helping people make the changes, and every single person had an error in it because I hadn't tested it, corrected, right, before I did the walkabout. All right, now it's doing the same thing. Enter one number per line or negative 999 to quit. 12, 13, 14, negative 999. Can you enter? Okay, so there, what would you do to re-enter another number? To enter the same number twice, no, or to go through the thing again. To, to let it ask you again, enter one number per line or the negative nine nine nine. Well, I could have just copied this statement, right? I could copy this statement and paste it here, <coughs> but the reason I didn't do that, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of a clean and slightly different interface to make it look like. Where it's asking for one number per line and we don't have to print out another message like we were doing the other place. Okay. But if we want to make it look like that, it's real easy to do. No, it's fine. Here's what I would do. <laughs> I was going to show you. Don't make this change, guys. This is just a demo. But I would do that C out here. Right? And then it would look just like the other loop. That makes sense? Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to undo those changes. About time to wrap this up. So since we don't have a homework assignment already created in advance for this, oh, by the way, remember, no class on Wednesday. So y'all can go out and party. Wait, today is Wednesday. No, it isn't. Tuesday. Today is Tuesday. No class Thursday, just like you said. Right, no class Thursday. No class Thursday. All right, so homework. Write a loop that will print the numbers. One through 20. Write a second loop that will print the numbers 30 through 690 skipping by tens. In other words, a step of 10. X plus equals 10. Something like that. And then write a third loop that will print a number, its square, and its cube. And you know what a square and a cube is. X comma, X times X, and X times X times X. Or if you feel like using the POW function, you can do that. For the numbers, One to twenty. And if we ought to do the data entry, but we did several copies of the data entry, and whatever I asked, you'd probably just copy and paste. So let me think if we can come up with an alternative in the next thirty seconds. We're gonna stop there. All right. We'll do the data entry loop for homework for next Tuesday. All right.
make a Dropbox for those who need to scamper out. <laughs>